Adam, you can go ahead. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Gecko. Um, so Gecko is hosted by the Gastro Foundation associated with Pro um, Project Echo, University of New Mexico, every second Monday at six o'clock. The chat will be open for questions. So today we're talking about short bowel syndrome and high output stoma, and Asif's going to do a presentation for us, and um, I'll be monitoring the chat. And we'll obviously have some discussion afterwards. So, Nasif, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Adam. I appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity and to Project Echo. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Is that, uh, is that clear? Yeah, it's good. All right. Thanks. So, I'll be. So I've been tasked with preparing this uh, presentation, um, and as a physician, I have to admit, I had to educate myself, um, particularly around the normal anatomy and physiology of the intestine, and I hope to bring that across in the course of this presentation. So in terms of, in terms of short bowel syndrome, the normal small bowel length is quite a wide variation, about 275 to 840 centimeters. And short bowel syndrome is defined as essentially less than 200 centimeters in continuity of the intestine. And the intestinal failure depends on the anatomy, integrity, and the adaptive potential of what's left in the small bowel. So put, put, just kind of sort of, put, put sort of simplistically, intestinal failure is that reduction in the gut function as it leads to the diminished ability to absorb in the small intestine below the minimum required to maintain nutrients, electrolytes, and hydration status for health and growth. And importantly, the level has dropped to such a level that, the, that there is requirements for intravenous or enteral supplementation. The term intestinal insufficiency is when no intravenous support is required. In other words, we, we, we do not require TPN. In terms of the classification of intestinal failure, it's categorized uh, in terms of the time when it presents. So type, so type one is in the post-operative period, it tends to be self-limiting. Type two intestinal failure um, occurs weeks to months after the event, and so that may be due to a fistula or diversion. And type three, which occurs for years later on, um, would, would be sh uh, typically short bowel syndrome. So look at the causes of intestinal failure. On top, and 75% of the causes and the overwhelming majority is short bowel syndrome. Um, and any of those other important causes need to be considered. Um, importantly, while short bowel syndrome is the cause, often important precipitants needs to be looked at, and that I'll be speaking to in the course of this presentation. So the common cause of short bowel syndrome, it may be related to a massive resection, whether it's due to trauma, bowel obstruction, Crohn's disease, or a vascular catastrophe maybe a disease um, that has caused a loss of absorption, typically being um, radiation, but also patients that had, uh, sorry, could typically being Crohn's disease, but also um, patients that had radiation for a malignancy or mesenteric ischemia. And in children, the commonest cause is uh, necrotizing enterocolitis um, and congenital causes such as mid-gut valvulus should be considered. Now to understand this um, in terms of what causes and how it comes about, I think it's important to understand, you know, um, the various factors as it led to, to intestinal function. So the first factor to be considered is the small intestine length. So the normal length is about 480 centimeters, but importantly, there's a wide variation. And the wide variation is quite important, and I'll be coming back to that in the course of this presentation. And as I said a bit earlier, less than 200 centimeters is the is to, is definition of small bowel syndrome. But importantly, the presence of the colon is very important in the context of short bowel syndrome because it may mitigate, you know, the functioning pain and payment that's caused by um, the short bowel syndrome. And roughly, if half your colon is in, it's equivalent to approximately 50 centimeters of a small bowel. And therefore, it's very important, you know, post-optively to, evalu to evaluate um, the, res the residual bowel not sort of so much what's taken out or sort of what's left behind. Um, and that should be done interoperatively. It should be, it should be noted in the operative notes. 
But if that's not available, that should be done on cross-section imaging, um, such as a CT scan. The next important uh, determinant of intestinal function is the site of intestinal dissection. So that may be, um, patient may have had a jejunal dissection, patient may have an idle dissection that often involves the cecum, or the patient may have had an, an extensive dissection where you only left with a with a, with a jejunum, but you've but the ileum as well as the colon has been removed. So in terms of the jejunum, the jejunum is a is the primary sort of absorptive area for bacterial and micronutrients. Why? Because it has large long villi, it is a large absorptive surface. Um, it receives um, content, fluid content that is highly concentrated in digestive enzymes. Um, in the jejunum, there's active transport of carrier proteins. But also, very importantly, within the jejunum, there's this wide intercellular junction that's quite leaky that allows for flux of fluid when there's absorption or secretion. And that's particularly important when we speak about the heart and stoma. Um, so, and typically within the jejunum, it's, a, it's an area that where iron is, uh, is uh, being absorbed, including the duodenum, calcium, and folate, and hence, um, jejunal, jejunal resections is often associated with deficiencies of those micronutrients. In terms of ileal dissection, um, the ileal is quite important um, because you know it's, a, it's it's an area. I'll speak about the components of the ileal, but um, the amount of ileal that is resected is particularly important if it's more than hundred centimeters or less than hundred centimeters. If it's less than hundred centimeters, there's the excess of bile um, that causes uh, bile 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 salt uh, diarrhea. If there's more than hundred centimeters of of ileal that has been resected. Um, there is a disruption of the enterohepatic circulation as as uh, fluid is being reabsorbed back into the into the porti, uh, hepatic circulation, um, and that results essentially with more than hundred centimeters. This um, that the, the, the bowel acids is lost more than what the liver is able to to produce, and that essentially results in bowel acid deficiency. Um, so typically, um, in, in, in this context, you may have um, a fat malabsorption, you may have loss of vitamin K dependent uh, clotting factors, there may be bone disease as well as axillate stones. So just about the ileum, particularly of relevance to fluid absorption, within the ileum, there's tight intercellular junctions, they're certainly tighter than the jejunum, there's less water and fluid flux as it, as it happens in the jejunum, but there's active transport of sodium. And when sodium is being transported, fluid is being reabsorbed. And through this process, there's a, one has the ability to, the body has the ability to concentrate the ileal context, um, contents. Now, this concept of ileal break is important, especially with the loss of the ileum. Now, the ileal break, normally, um, what happens is that there's, there's that unabsorbed lipids that reaches the ileum causes delayed gastric emptying. So this delayed gastric emptying, it decreases the transit time so the, 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 the content of the ileum stays for longer and that allows for more time for nutrient absorption. And this ileal break is mediated by gut hormones, especially G GLP-2, we'll speak about that shortly. Next, if have, has, in terms of has the inocecal valve been removed? So the inocecal valve regulates passage of fluid and nutrients from the ileum to the colon and therefore causes like sort of a, causes a, a, a delay of fluids and thereby decreasing the intestinal transit, and in the process, increasing the absorption um, of, uh, of, of, of contents from the, from the ileum. So, so therefore, and, and, the, and, the, and the loss of the inocecal valve is associated significantly with an increased um, prevalence of small bowel intestinal, um, intestinal bacterial overgrowth that can cause fat malabsorption and uh, diarrhea. In kids, um, the loss of the, IC, of, the, of the IC valve is associated with difficulty in weaning from TPN. Importantly, um, you know, in the context of short bowel syndrome, what's the impact of the stomach and panc pancreatic function? Now, importantly, there's this loss of negative feedback, you know, for inhibiting gastric secretion and acid production in the context of short bowel syndrome. So this lack of negative feedback results in hypergastinemia and gastric hypersecretion. And that causes an increased amount of secretions into the small bowel, and 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 with increased acid coming into the small bowel, causes a decreased pH, aggravates fluid losses, as well as peptic complications in the proximal small bowel. 
In patients um, with small bowel syndrome, with short bowel syndrome, they have normal pancreatic and biliary secretions. So what about the colon? So like I said earlier, half the colon, um, it's approximately equal to, to, to about 50% of the small intestine. Um, and in the colon, it's the slowest area of transit and it's, it has the tightest um, junctions compared to, to the small intestine. And therefore, the, the colon is actually very efficient um, in terms of salt and water absorption. And, and about sort of one to one of liters of fluid a day that reaches the colon is being reabsorbed. But importantly, um, it can, the colon can absorb up to seven liters of water per day. That's something that, I've, that I never knew before. And approximately, the colon can absorb about 700 millimoles of sodium and about 40 millimoles of potassium. But also, the colon has other functions, such as absorption of short-chain fatty acids, and the colonic bacteria assist in the absorption of fermented carbohydrates. So, short bowel syndrome, um, understanding that, has a particular, um, there are three types. Type 1 is related to this business of the endogenostomy. This, uh, according to this literature that I did, it's a commonest type and most commonly caused by IBD. Type 2 um, is where, you know, there's a jejunal colic anastomosis. Now, the item has been removed in certain um, parts of the colon. That's type 2. And type 3 is probably the more favorable for the patient is where there's, where there's a jejunal ileal um, anastomosis and part of the colon. Now, important, if the colon is present, it's important that we chat with Adam and his team because by reconnecting the colon, um, it's important because it imparts a greater benefit. And in this in this particular study done in 1999, there's an increased survival with colon continuity compared to an injured and in jejunostomy, and it's quite significant over a 10-year period. So as you as a short bowel, various parts of the short bowel has as various parts of the small intestine has been removed. The intestine can undergo various adaptations, and it's important to, un to understand that. And it's particularly important in as the size and the length of the intestine seems to vary from patient to patient. So, and the small bowel can undergo macroscopic as well as microscopic changes to increase its absorptive capacity. And I've summarized, I've created this table, um, those changes as it compares to the jejunum, the ileum. So it may be functional changes or structural changes. So the jejunum has mainly has functional changes and minimum structural changes. However, the ileum undergoes significant functional as well as structural changes in response to short bowel syndrome. But with this intestinal um, adaptation, there certainly changes to the gut microbiota, especially if we have removed the IC valve. And that causes sort of a lack of bacterial diversity and an overgrowth of this bug called lactobacillus. So lactobacillus there's a list, can cause um, uh, bacterial overgrowth, but importantly, it can cause this condition of delactic acidosis that I'll speak about shortly. So, and this intestinal adaptation, it occurs because um, uh, what, what happens also is that the nutrients in the lumen, um, in the gut lumen, causes the release of trophic gut hormones that promotes this adaptation process. And um, the most common hormone that is that that uh, that is that is involved in this process is GLP-2, which promotes intestinal growth. So GLP-2, it is being released from the L cells in the terminal ileum as well as the colon, but it acts in the jejunum. The other hormones that is involved in intestinal adaptation is gastrin, which affects your motility, and I spoke up and I spoke about that a bit earlier. So in terms of how patients may present the short bowel syndrome. Certainly the most common presentation is that of di diarrhea or dehydration, causing a high output stoma that we'll speak about shortly. Diarrhea as well as, and with this diarrhea and fluid loss, patients have an increased chance of developing renal failure, but also be aware of this concept of um, renal stones can also cause causing renal failure. Uh, patients can be, can be malnourished. Um, and also there's typically a loss of various electrolytes and macronutrients that depend essentially on which part of the intestine has been removed. Um, whether it's hypokalemia, calcium and magnesium, B12, um, as well as fat, so fat soluble vitamins. We also at risk of developing uh, metabolic bone disease. Um, patients that, that are long from TPN, they may develop hepatic steatosis and cholestasis, and there's an increased incidence of um, cholesterol stones, gallstones, 
essentially due to the, the loss of bile, there's cholesterol super um, there's, there's a super saturation of cholesterol that causes cholesterol stones. Patients also had the risk of esophagitis and peptic ulcer disease, and I most spoke about that a bit. I spoke about that a bit earlier with the increased levels of gastrin. But this concept of delactic acidosis is uncommon, but it does occur. And what happens there is that this lactobacillus, this lactobacillus converts delactate into the L-lactate. Now, delactate can't be absorbed, but L-lactate can be absorbed, and the patients get in, and the L-lactate is absorbed in the, into the blood system, and patients get the current episodes of lactic acidosis. So in terms of the diarrhea in patients with short bowel syndrome, it's multifactorial. It may be due to the decreased absorptive area. It may be due to, due to a reduction in the GI intestinal transit. It may be due to hypersecretion of fluids that I spoke about earlier. Um, but also there's uh, pancreatic exocrine dysfunction as well as and, and fat malabsorption. But also the increased incidence of bacterial overgrowth can also cause um, uh, diarrhea. So in terms of the second part of this talk being the high output stoma, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very common complication. And it's a commonest complication of um, patients with short bowel syndrome, especially as it presents acutely. And in high output stoma, there is fluid, electrolyte, as well as nutritional complications that I'll speak about. The incidence is about 16 to 30% of all ileostomies, and about 77% of patients require ongoing treatments. And um, the 60-day ileostomy readmission rates is about 14% of which about 40% is due to dehydration with a fluid losses. Um, it's less common than a colostomy, except um, being if patients had a proximal colostomy with an ex extensive small bowel resection. So this, the, the problem of high output stoma has a significant impact on, on patients and the health system. There's an increased hospital length of stay. There's an increased readmission rates significantly impacts the nutritional state of the patients. There's a risk of renal failure. But also, with this diarrhea, the impact on the on the skin and keeping the, because of the difficulty in keeping the skin dry. Um, yeah. So normally, uh, the, the normal anaerostomy output, it's about 600 to 1,200 moles, probably a little, a little bit more of a 24-hour period. The definition, and I've been looking around to see what's the exact definition, and I found from the literature that um, it's defined as a high output stoma is defined as 1,500 moles over 24 hours, but for about 48 to 72 hours. Some of the guidance in the UK used the three day cutoff, and most of the recent literature I read was about 48 hours. So I'll say 48 to 72 hours. Importantly, if you're losing more than a liter, we wanted of dehydration. At 1.5 liters, we wanted about malnutrition, but essentially more than two liters patients will require TPN. The physiology of high output stoma is that there's a loss of normal daily secretions, loss of sodium and water. There's a, and as, as has happened, patients cons consume excessive amounts of hypertonic fluid. There's gastric acid hypersecretion. And, you know, there's a rapid GI transit that adversely affects nutrition because of decrease absorption time, but also drug absorption as well. So that's the, those are the key factors that underlies the development of high output stoma. And it's, this, there's a large amount of patient variation um, due to the varying sizes of the, um, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the remaining intestine, but also different patients have very different amounts of intestinal adaptation that I spoke about a bit earlier. So when the output is high, the question is why is the patient having a high output? Well, it could just be due to a, sh a short bowel, right? Could be due to a diseased bowel, whether it's Crohn's, radiation, or partial obstruction, or increased motility. Now, sepsis in the stoma is particularly important. So while short bowel syndrome is a common underlying cause of heart stoma, sepsis drives the stoma. And in every single patient, um, sepsis should be actively looked for. Um, in patients with every single patient with heart stoma, sepsis should be actively looked for. And an ileus is a common symptom in patients with an anastomotic leak, with an anastomotic leak. But important to remember that while certainly abdominal sepsis is common, non-abdominal sepsis such as UTIs, pneumonias, terpsite sepsis, um, patients on deep and catheter sepsis, those can also cause sepsis that can cause heart and stoma. If the abscess, if, if abscess is present in the abdomen, it makes your CRP and what's the card very difficult to interpret. So as I've said now, the you know the cause of high output stoma um, 
uh, certainly short uh, short bowel syndrome is a, is a commonest, but as I said, sepsis is a commonest, and we spoke about abdominal sepsis. Um, an important point that I that I came across in one review article I read is that um, is that sepsis causes hyperalbuminemia, and that may cause you know loss of fluid and decreases in cortic pressure, causing edema of the stoma, and that may aggravate the outlet obstruction and the and the amount of heart stoma that you see. Other than sepsis. We we need to look at the at the drug chart, especially if the patient on the pro on the prokinetic drug. Um, patient may have been on codeine and uh, we've now taken it away. That can also cause heart and stoma. But also to remember that C diff can involve the small bowel as well. The other causes that we those are some of the other causes that we need to consider in terms of if it's persistent, um, particularly the particularly um, um, bowel obstruction. So how do we manage patients with high output storm stomas? Um, the principles of management is firstly to correct the dehydration and electrolyte imbalance, to reduce the output, whether it's pharmacological or non-pharmacological means, to support the nutrition, and to identify and treat the underlying cause of high output stoma. So this diagram reminds us, I'm going to speak now about the, the fluid management. So this diagram reminds us of you know, the various parts of the GI tract, as it relates to the fluid. So we get about, we, someone taking about two liters a day on average of fluids. On saliva, we get about 1,500 moles. The stomach from the gastric acid secretions about 1,500 moles. And about a liter comes from the liver and pancreas. Um, but importantly to remember is that if they the, the, the small intestine can, um, the, especially the proximal intestine can, the, the jejunum particularly, there may be up to two liters of fluid a day. And from about the ninth, now, now, the nine liters of fluid into the small intestine, the overwhelming majority is being reabsorbed, about 7,800 moles. And that and that feeds down, in about 1,200 moles is left, and that feeds down into the colon that can reabsorb most of it. So that's such that at the end of the day, we lose about 150 moles of fluid in our feces. So this is a, this this diagram I got in the one in the BMJ. It just shows one of the issues with the heart with stoma is that Patients drink lots of water, especially also if they be taking the emodiums, they're thirsty, they're taking lots of fluids. And actually, and actually what happens is that, you know, as patients drink hypertonic fluid, you know, that's low in sodium, the challenge is that within the blood, you know, the blood has a osmolality, has a concentration of sodium of 140, 140 millimoles and a normal osmolality of, of 290. So if patients are drinking lots of water and hypertonic fluid, there's a net shift in, sale, in, in, in sodium from this plasma into the jejunum, such that eventually at the end of the stoma, um, there's about 100 millimoles of, 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 of sodium left. So important. And as the sort of, as, as sodium moves into your lumen, water follows. So you can become more and more dehydrated. So, so as patients drink lots and lots of water, it actually makes it worse. Um, and after about 100 centimeters of jejunum, the, that, that, that value of 100 centimeters is kind of the transition point. You know, we, 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 before that, uh, patients may be net secretors, and after that, patients may be net absorbers. But roughly, there's about 100 millimoles of sodium after that. Also to say that within the jejunum, there's an active transport of, um, of, 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 of sodium um, uh, from the, um, that there's an active transport of sodium from the lumen, um, to, to facilitate in normal, in, normal, in, in normal health, to facilitate the absorption of sodium and water falling afterwards. And that's important because to ensure that we reach 100 moles of, of um, other 100 millimoles of sodium, otherwise there's this net flow of fluid into the lumen as I spoke about in the previous slide. And therefore, this 100 millimoles of sodium is important and that's the amount of sodium that we need to, that, that, that has to be supplemented with the oral rehydration solution. So something about the thirst reflex that's important, and it's something that's impacted significantly in this patient. So I had to go and pull out my own medic notes to, to go and advise myself. So the thirst center is located in the anterior wall of the third ventricle. And important to note is that the, the thirst center is quite distinct from your osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, you know, which is responsible for ADH release. But important to note that as is that is that the set point for ADH release is lower than that of thirst. So the body first releases ADH, and but later on, thirst is activated. So when someone is dehydrated, 
the body's initial response is first activating your renin angiotensin and aldosterone system, and then afterwards, um, um, the release of ADH from the hypothalamus. And that causes the reabsorption of water and sodium in the kidney. So, and only when the serum osmolality rises, right, despite, you know, the body being, despite ADH being released, um, only then thirst is activated. Um, and therefore, thirst is a later adaptation to dehydration. So the problem with stoma is that both sodium and water is lost. So because both is proportionally lost, the actual concentration of sodium remains unchanged. And therefore, the and therefore ADH release is a bit later, and therefore the thirst activation is being delayed. And this is and this can result in patients lose patients heart with some patients, they lose lots of sodium and water, and they can subsequently become profoundly dehydrated and with a much higher risk of developing acute kidney injury, especially, especially um, ischemic ATN. And therefore, looking at uh, what we commonly prescribe, the oral dehydration solution, typically the St. Mark solution, we use one liter of water, six tablespoons of glucose, um, roughly one, five to 10 moles of, um, of sodium chloride, add a bit of bicarb, Right, and to make it a bit more palatable, we may add, add some sort of uh, orange or squash just to make it a bit more um, to make it a bit more palatable. Um, that's the typical uh, the oral dehydration solution that is prescribed. Over the counter, we have access. A lot of patients use oral dehydrate. The challenge is that one session of oral dehydrate only has fifty millimoles of sodium. So therefore, patients need sort of and, and patients need more than one sachet to meet the requirements. Just to compare your oral dehydration solution and compare to the St. Mark solution, some, some, some minor some minor differences. So in terms of inpatient high output stoma, we should also consider the possibility of fluid distinction. As I've indicated earlier, patients taking lots of water can aggravate the amount of fluid losses. And so as patients lots of water, what comes in, so what goes in must come out. Patient may be, have a dry mouth from the emodium, um, and then essentially all this water that is that is being uh, that, that is being consumed by the patient may just essentially flush out the intestine and all end up in the ileostomy. So the recommendation is to for patients uh, as you start to consume 500 to 100 moles of of oral dehydration solution, and if patients are dehydrated, the rather give the, so, the sort of rather replace the the fluid loss, the intervascular fluid loss with intravenous fluids, such as normal saline. Um, and we see we, we tell patients to drink one to two, so a drink or two a day of the patient's choice, but not to drink, kind of limit that in terms of the amount of coffees and teas that the patients drink and to avoid caffeine. So, so how do we, beyond, beyond the fluids, how do we reduce the output? That perhaps is the incorrect target, which would rather be how can we increase absorption from the, from the gut, but also the number two, how to decrease uh, secretions. So to increase absorption, there are certain, certain drugs that we can use um, to decrease the motility, um, in the, whether your imodium, lopiramide, um, and then follow that by the opiates. I'll speak about it shortly. But what I'm reading, it's, it's only a modest amount of fluid that is that, that you can reduce the stoma by, about 250 mils. In terms of secretions, we can use a PPI, um, and, and with, with, especially with BD PPIs, all our patients have hypermagnesemia and by using BDP pads, there's a higher chance of patients uh, developing worsening hypermagnesemia. And with that, we can we get about a 500 mole fluid deductions. Octreotide, you know, it's recommended with patients that are not getting better. We can't, uh, we can't, we can't, we are kind of stuck after a few days. Octreotide can be used, but, it, but the problem is that the effect does not last. So just, so lopinamide, we recommend 30 minutes before meals. I've said there's two to eight tablets, but pretty much two tablets every sort of four times a day. It does cause a high mouth. And the problem with, the, with, with using too much, higher dose of lopinamide, it does affect your QT interval and lowering the, lowering the threshold for developing ventricular arrhythmias. It's expensive. 10 tablets of, of imodium plus 88, 88 rand. Um, coding phosphate, we need to be careful that it, the dose is... 30 to 60 milligrams three times a day. But the problem is being an opiate, it, it is addictive. And hence we kind of need to be very careful with it and limit and and uh, and often, you know, when you use it, use it, use it when, when you really need it, um, after if lopinamide has not worked. Um yeah. So 
I've spoken about the clinical presentation, but important in high stoma is to correct your electrolytes and your micronutrient deficiencies. Hypermagnesemia is common. About roughly half patients have hypermagnesemia. It's often due to a reduction in the absorption surface of, um, of the thermal ion in the colon. Um, the other electrolytes is hypo, hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, and often we have to correct the magnesium first, or else we will not be able to correct the potassium and the, and, and the phosphate. In terms of you know, if the ileum is being removed, um, there's, there's a vitamin B12 deficiency that occurs at about essentially more than 60% of the TI is being uh, absorbed. If for any reason the stomach has been resected, the patient can also develop B12 deficiency due to a lack of intensity factor. I spoke about the bile acids earlier, um, and if there's more than 100 moles of TI, I, as I've indicated, patients can develop bile acid deficiency. Less than 100 patients can have fat malabsorption from bile acids. In terms of the nutrition, the principles of nutrition in high stoma and short bowel syndrome is that um, we, need, we, we need to involve the dietitian in all aspects of patient care. And optimizing the patient's, um, uh, patient's nutrition is very important in the short term, but also the long term, especially if you want to have future surgery, such as, for example, reconnecting the colon. Um, and patients with, you know, that have a rapid GI, GI transit, there can be a loss of all um, the various nutrients. Um, and by, by optimizing nutrition, you may have small modest amounts of reduction in your high output stoma. But as I've said earlier, if the high output stoma is more than three two liters a day, patient requires TPN. So in terms of the various types of nutrition that we can offer, internal nutrition is certainly preferred. Um, it is it, it result in the increased absorption of the of nutrition. It has less complications because we don't have a you know we don't have a tip we don't have there's the, there's no lines if you're using pure internal nutrition, and because we are we are feeding the patient internally, there's less bowel atrophy and, and adaptation. What about comparing oral feeding to exclusive internal feeding or a combo of oral and internal? Certainly using internal feed or semi-elemental feed, there's an increased absorption of protein, lipids, as well as energy. So when, when should we consider TP in patients with high stoma? Post-operatively is usually short bowel patients that have high output, patients that have a high output fistula, which is defined as more than 500 mils in the fed state. Um, I've, I've spoken about a high output stoma more than two liters. But also, patients coming in, they're already malnourished and they're having a high stoma, our threshold to start TPN will be much lower as well. Um, but also, as we are feeding patients, what else can we do? Right? What else can we advise our patients? We can advise patients to consume more in the evening and less in the day. And this does have a positive effect in the stomach volume and consistency. We can advise patients to separate fluids from meals and pretty much drink, drink fluids in between meals. And this does um, improve the output volume and consistency. We advise patients to avoid hot and spicy foods. And when they eat, we tell them to chew the meals well. Rather have small, regular meals, at least six meals or snacks per day. It's slower. And when you and when they eat, if they can, increase the salt intake in the, increase the salt intake in their meals. If patients have lots of flatulence from the stomach bag, chewing gum or drinking with a straw may be a benefit. In terms of fat, um, especially fat in the context of, uh, of the bile acids, the concern of fat is that patients have a high fat intake that does stimulate secretions from your pancreas and from your liver, which increase the volume intestine and that can aggravate the high output stoma. And I've spoken already about your, the issue of having more than 100 centimeters of terminal island resected and the impact that it has on bile acid deficiency. In terms of which, um, what is our, what is the recommendations from, the, from, a, from an additional point of view? In terms of carbohydrates, the recommendation is to in increase simple carbohydrates such as white rice, white bread, and it's easy to absorb white rice, then brown rice and brown bread. Pasta as well as marshmallows, and in Professor Butal's one talk, he does present a random mass control trial, a small study that shows increased uh, sort of uh, absorption of fluids using marshmallows. Protein, the recommendation is to use high quality protein at each meal. Um, but also in terms of fiber, the general recommendation is to reduce the fiber intake and to avoid fresh food and vegetables. However, in certain patients, one can consider fiber gel because fiber absorbs water and it bulks up the stool and the intended contents. 
in terms of oxalate, because the big issue there is calcium oxalate stones and kidney stones. Um, this needs to be limited in patients, especially if a colon is present. But when they have oxalate stone, when we, if oxalate is being given, especially in the TPN, they needs to be monitored. You don't have to carefully because of the higher chance of developing kidney stones. So this slide just summarizes what I've just said in terms of what we can use to decrease the motility, to reduce the secretions, some of the key diet factors, as well as one of the vitamins that we should be that should be um, should be uh, replaced. If nothing works, you know, um, and put the patient having pretty much a refractory um, heart and stoma, we kind of have to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, repeat the scope and do the dental biopsies. We'd want to, we'd want to do an MRE to look out to to rule out partial obstructions. Um, when we're doing uh, putting up the scope up the up the distal portion of the stoma, doing doing biopsies of the mucosa um, in the right setting, but possibly in an intestinal failure unit, considering distal oralization solution, distal feeding, and the feeding intercolysis of which I do not know much about. And in conclusion, um, I've told you that uh, short bowel syndrome is associated with numerous short and long-term complications that significantly affect the patient's quality of life. And knowing the length of the residual bowel postoperative is important. Um, the presence of a colon significantly mitigates some of the complications of small bowel syndrome, especially acutely. Um, and hence, in patients, especially in family bowel disease and their short bowel syndrome, I think there has to be very carefully considered uh, any bowel operation needs to be very carefully considered at, at the risk of obviously worsening the short bowel syndrome. And when patients present acutely with high output stoma, managing sepsis, fluid, and managing their nutrition is very, very important. And finally, what's very clear, in, especially in the context of an intestinal failure unit, this patients, these patients require very, a very well and efficient management of the multidisciplinary team that includes your colorectal surgeon, your medical GI, your dietitian, et cetera, as well as possibly psychologists or patients that are, that are chronically managed. I just want to thank uh, Professor Butal as well as uh, Annalena de Toit uh, from the Dietetics for, help for, for giving me the slides, which I've incorporated into this presentation, and those were the other references that I used to prepare this presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nasif. It's an outstanding presentation. Every time I thought, oh, I wrote down something to say, I must just comment on this. The next slide came in, commented exactly on that. So, well done. I think the one thing I would say is just be careful on exact measurements and outcomes in people. You know, like two liters for an ileostomy. I mean, it's a guideline. So two liters ileostomy needs TPN. It will involve the vast majority of people. But it is quite remarkable how some people cope with things and especially young people how they can adapt to cope with things speaking about adaptation you only your bowel is only completely ad adapted as much as it will after two years although after a year you're unlikely to get much further adaptation and because and the terminal ileum has the although it drives the adaptation it also has the ability to adapt the most the patients with a proximal nj genostomy are really the most difficult ones to manage um, but yeah, and if you faced with having to resect proximal bowel or distal bowel, I always tell the surgeons, you know, if you've got a choice, if you've got multiple enterotomies or something like that, take proximal bowel and leave the distal bowel. Are there any questions from the floor or comments? It's quite a we see quite a lot of patients coming into hospital with ileostomies that end up in the Department of Medicine. And, you know, we've had a patient, a famous patient, who ended up getting dialyzed for quite some time. And eventually, one of the stoma, they had problems with the stoma, and they asked the stoma therapists to, to see the patient. And we found out about her, and we just um, poured in fluid, and she came off her dialysis. So you do get these patients profoundly happy. Um, profoundly hypovolemic essentially from from dehydration because they don't get thirsty when they're dehydrated and they um you know it sort of it, it compounds the dehydration they're getting more and more dehydrated and they don't get thirsty so the advice we give every patient with an ileostomy is when you're feeling like that just getting up is a massive effort you've got a headache 
or when you stand up, you get dizzy. You're getting dehydrated. If your ileostomy output is high, take a modium, take oral rehydration solution. And if that's not working, get into hospital straight away. But even medically educated patients come into hospital with ureas and creatinines, sort of, you know, in the 300s by the time they actually get in. It happens very, very quickly. Um, Adam, can I just ask you in terms of surgery for these patients, especially short bowel syndrome, how do you, like, generally, what do you use for planning surgery? I spoke a bit about the nutrition in the talk, but I didn't cover sort of reconnection and when you plan surgery and just what, what guidance do you use in the IF unit? So we won't do any operation on a patient within three months of their previous operation. I mean, we will do it within 10 days, but not a closure stoma. So I'll reoperate on someone within 10 days. And then after that, you're inoperable essentially till three months. A lot of internationally, a lot of units will only reoperate within six months, but they have the ability to give TPN at home quite easily, which makes life a lot easier and giving fluid at home quite easily. For us, that's a mission. So we keep in patients in hospital for three months. And let's say you've got a double-barreled stoma that's high output. We will then at three months close you. The one thing that works very nicely, which you touched on about, was refeeding enterocolysis. If you feed the distal limb of the ileostomy, it turns off the stoma output almost instantly. You know, it, it really does. It's something that's stimulating that adaptation, but it's quicker than the, than the GLP-2 should be working. It literally, if you've got a patient with five liters coming out of his proximal ileostomy, let's say he's got a stoma at, at, um, at 100 centimeters, and if we've got access to the distal limb, you get a catheter in, you put contrast down it, and then you refeed the what's coming out of the stoma. You, it'll come down almost straight away. And there's some reflex there that, that seems to do that. So it, it's a useful trick. The other, th the only time we will use octreotide is when people are in that hypersecretory phase that you spoke about. And you often get a guy coming in, you know, he's got a stoma at 30 centimeters. That will eventually settle down to about two liters. The problem is that when it's seven liters at the beginning, it can be seven liters the one day and five liters the next day. You can very quickly get four liters behind in fluid. So it's quite difficult to manage those patients with very, very high output because they go nine liters, five liters, you know, and the difference in your fluid rates that you or normal saline that you're going to be giving is going to be, should we give four liters today or should we give seven liters today? And so there I find octreotide quite useful just in the short term to bring things down. The other thing you can do is make the patient no pass. So if you, if you stop the patient eating and drinking, their output will come down. But that's obviously not a sustainable solution. But it's just those patients in the sort of hypersecretory phase, very, very high output, where you're really struggling. It's very difficult to get people to stop eating and drinking, though. They tend to, most of us tend to like eating and some drinking. Just... Um, any comment on optimal period strategy of weaning off TPN and attempting to initiate enteral feeds? Well, it depends on the clinical situation. You know, if you, um, I mean, the moment that gut's working, you must use it. So if you've got a fistula or anything, we always let you eat. You can eat whatever you want. I don't believe to close a fistula, you don't need to stop eating. So we will, we'll only give you enteral, we'll only give you, so if you're eating, that's fine. Then you've got TPN. So there's ordinary eating and there's TPN. And then there's a marginal benefit between ordinary eating of giving enteral feed. Because you're trickling the food in slowly, you're slightly using your bowel slightly more efficiently. So there's a small group of patients that are just on the edge of coping, but aren't quite. And you can possibly give them enteral feed. But you know, the moment you're not going to get a huge advantage over ordinary eating by snacking regularly. Uh, compared to enteral feed. So we use a bit of enteral feeding, but not a vast amount. As far as weaning TPN is concerned, I mean, usually we'll carry on until surgery is off, or you'll notice what the, as the output comes down of the stoma, if that's the issue. Um, if you're all connected and you're on TPN and we're waiting to see how adaptation plays out, we will, if we've, uh, so in the private sector, we do home TPN. And then what we do is we drop a day. So you start off on seven days TPN, then you go to six days, five days, and we just monitor your weight over time. You can go about a day a month. Um, hi, Catherine. I see Catherine Edwards is here seen on the screen. She's just asked a question, perhaps a comment on using liquid medications to improve absorption. Um, so certainly if you're seeing tablets in the ileostomy output, they're not working. 
saying that the vast majority of medication is absorbed proximally. Um, but certainly if you've got, you know, you, you're going to get a slight better and, you know, most, most medication you can get as a liquid. It's a good point to make. So be careful when you're um, giving people magnesium because of hypermagnesemia, that tends to push your stoma output. And if you're going to use, give magnesium, then eff the effervescent magnesium is probably the most efficiently absorbed. Although magnesium is the electrolyte that is the bane of my life because we have a lot of patients that can cope with the fluid, they can cope with the nutrition, but they get persistent hypermagnesemia and it's damn difficult to give. You've got to give it over four hours as a minimum. The most efficient way to give magnesium is to give it as slowly as possible. So if you give magnesium, over, if you've got a drip up, don't give the patient, you're running normal saline at 84 mils per hour. Don't give the magnesium as a 200 mil, two amps and 200 mils over four hours. Put it in that bag because the more, the quicker you give the magnesium, the higher you raise the serum levels and it gets secreted in the kidneys as a result. So you want to actually just sneak the levels up. You don't want to bolus them up. Um, VG asking on GLP-1. So I, it's about a million rand a year. So this is the taduclotides and the various other molecules. Um, before COVID, when I spent a little bit of time at St. Mark's, they didn't have access to it. Um, unless it was in a trial situation. Um, I've had no experience of it, although we do have a patient whose brother is a billionaire, so we th we look, and he might well benefit from it, so we're looking at it. My, um, having spoken, speaking to Simon Gabe about it, St. Mark's, you can literally see if the patient's got an ileostomy, you can literally see the villi growing out the ileostomy like hairs. The problem with it is that when you stop it, then the hairs grow shorter again. So you've got to stay on it. So I think there's, if you're looking at short-term use, there's perhaps a group of patients that are going to adapt enough in a year to get off TPN, and perhaps that can accelerate it. But, you know, it's so far off our radar, even in the private sector. Um, Catherine, I don't know if you've had any experience with the GLP-1s. Sorry, I, I just unmuting. No, I um, I think you know, just not beyond what you just said, Adam. Um, but maybe I was just thinking, I was going to just type in, uh, you might say, want to say something about bowel length, intestinal lengthening procedures, step and uh, just to educate our, 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 us physicians. Well, I, I've you learned all about these various um, things in, in pediatric surgery, where you kind of either do various things to make the bowel longer or to slow down the transit reversing segments. There's one unit in the UK that's allowed to do the step procedure. Um, at, at, at Salford, um, and they centralized it all. They'd done two in 10 years, and while I was at St. Mark's, they put the one guy that was one of the two back onto TPN. Not sure if they did that because they knew I was going to Salford shortly afterwards. <laughs> For sure not. So my take on those things is, is outside of the pediatric surgical population, they don't really, there's something that, that they exist more in a textbook than in the real world. I think We've certainly so. taken it on. But as I and I see, thank you very much for your presentation. It started to outline. I think it's really useful to sort of classify in your mind your approach, both in the pedi you know, short bowel syndrome in the pediatric presentation, uh, and there, of course, there's you know some ongoing work on uh, autologous stem cell transplantation uh, as well, and the adult setting, and then also to think about causes in in those different groups very differently. And of course, we're all adult physicians here, so. Uh, and in the UK, Crohn's remains the most common cause uh, of uh, sh short bowel. Yeah, for, for us, look, we've got a huge group of patients with short bowel that just get um, palliated straight off. So most of the patients that have an SMA occlusion, surgeon will open, they might phone me, they might not. And unless it's an exceptional case, if you've got under 50 centimetres of small bowel, we'll recommend that you leave the infarcted intestine and closed morphine infusion and that's that. Um, but, you know, it's sometimes every now and again, we have cases where I sort of think, well, 65 centimeters, we've got a chance. You're a young patient. We'll try. Interestingly, we've got very few patients with Crohn's that have short bowel syndrome. So if we look at um, home PN, so in the intestinal failure unit in private, Dion and I run in private, the, um, we've got seven patients on home PN, 
only two are fistulae at the moment. Um, one is short bowel or due to multiple surgeries of adhesive bowel obstruction. And then we've got, and the patients that seem to do by far the best is the chronic intestinal pseudo obstructions. So they're kind of still eating and they get a lot less sepsis. They do far better than any of the others. Um, if we had to look at patients in crude ski, we've actually had very few patients that are candidates for home TPN and that we've got very few candidates with, with bowel that's that short, but it, you know, I suspect what we've got is we've got a huge selection bias that the patients just aren't getting to us um, because we don't have access to home PN, so they are palliated. But I have to say that when I went to St. Mark's, I thought that home PN was complete Western medicine gone completely mad, and I've changed my mind entirely on that. You can have a fantastic quality of life on home PN. The very first patient I ever saw in an outpatient, being a surgeon, I'm not really in love with outpatients, but it was the best outpatients I've ever been to. First patient was a 25-year-old girl who'd had an ischemic event. She was doing applied maths at Cambridge, and she had a big argument with the gastroenterologist who does triathlons and Ironmans because she was also doing triathlons, and he wanted to hold back in the swim because she might get kicked on the line, and she didn't want to hold back in the swim because it would mess up her times. And that really, we came. I came back from that trip, and we started a home PN program in South Africa. She was one of ten patients we saw in our patients, all of them, not all quite that impressive, but it was a, a very um, you really patients with really good quality of life. So, if you've got patients out there that you think might benefit please contact us because we are trying to establish a program it's quite small at the moment but um st mark's at the time had 481 patients on home pn we've got six but that's really seven. to hear adam yeah. that's great to hear really impressive um I just, I just made looking... a quick point about sepsis and translocation of bacteria across the gut, the gut wall. Uh, the SPS patients, are, of course, got increased translocation, I think you mentioned, uh, and that makes them more prone to sepsis. I've never really understood why a patient will come in with a UTI and the ileostomy output will just go up to two litres and they'll come in massively dehydrated. But it's, you know, the sepsis can be absolutely anywhere. And the point that Nassif was trying to make is just because a patient's if there's a, a recent history of surgery, just because the surgeon says there's a low CRP and a low white cell count does not mean that they don't have an intra-abdominal abscess, trust me. I've got a personal collection of patients with intra-abdominal abscesses with CRPs of below five that definitely exceeds 10 patients, unfortunately. Any other questions? Uh, Hi, Adam. Hi, uh, I thought I will just ask. It's a bit of a stupid uh, question, but I uh, may as well ask anyway. High output stoma versus a high output uh, fistula. Um, in terms of the uh, non-surgical like, management, any major difference? It's the same story about fluids and all of that there, or is there anything unique? There, there is no difference, but just remember, you can have a fistula that you're still passing stool, so then perhaps you've got a little bit of extra absorption. That, but if you look at patients who come to us with high output stomas versus a high output fistula, the mortality rate is vastly high in high output fistula. It's they, they're more difficult to manage, and they have intra-abdominal sepsis more often. So it's a much I mean, we much prefer a high output stoma to a high output fistula to the point that I track in the unit, what we're getting. And any time the fistulas are, if, if we look in a year and we're getting more fistulas than high output stomas, because if you're a surgeon, you get a choice at some stage. You're doing an operation, you can do an anastomosis again, or you can bring it out as a stoma. The problem is if you keep doing the anastomosis, that breaks down and becomes a fistula. So we say, don't do a high risk anastomosis, rather do the safe thing and, and bring out a stoma. But it's a balance and it's a difficult choice that has to be made at the time of surgery because there's no absolute predictor of, a, of risk. But I track to, if high outputs, if our admissions are mostly for, becoming more for fistula and less for stoma, I go out and do education sessions in our uh, referral centers to try and get it. We always 
slightly dominant. So when we started off the IF unit, we were sitting at about 20% high, high output stomas and 80% high output fistulas. And now we're sitting at about 55% high output stomas and 45% fistulas. But for the absolute medical management of them, you know, of, of the high output, it's exactly the same. For all intents and purposes, a fistula is a stoma, but the prognosis is worse and the complications around it and the surgery is vastly worse. Remember, a stoma we can just close locally in a small procedure, fistula you've got to do a big laparotomy for. But definitely not a stupid question, not that such a thing exists. I don't really believe in stupid questions, but it was a good one. Thanks, VG. Thanks. Okay, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And uh, speaking about the unit today in um, like in Cape Town, are there any other um, areas in South Africa, like in uh, um, Donald uh, Gordon. Sort of Johannesburg? Yeah, John Donald Gordon. And here, <laughs> and here, to be honest, I'm not familiar with any unit. I think most of these patients end up with hours uh, in the various uh, surgical like you know, departments. I don't think there's a centralized a uh, surgical department that actually handles them. So, Alicia, Donald, so Brendan. Brendan Bevington and Donald Gordon does it, but not quite in as organized a fashion as we have. Um, but yeah, the, the Kruderski is the only um, dedicated intestinal failure unit in a state hospital on the continent. Um, but, and then uh, UCT Private is a satellite of that. So, kind of, but yeah, we're the only ones with an established unit that you know, this is this area, this space, these nurses. And I think that really is the critical thing because essentially IF units are just line management centers. You know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of places, a bit like ICU, you kind of manage everyone exactly the same. But what you need is you need nursing staff that know that that central line or pick line or tunneled line is this patient's absolute lifeline and they've got to manage it. You know, it's it's just line sepsis. You know, you've got to get on top of your line sepsis. I speak to colleagues around the country, you know, they, they, that's that's the big killer. And unless you establish a unit that's got the same nurses working every day in the same space, you know, there's no point. And if I actually think about it, Adam, it, sh it really, sh in terms of like, you know, line sepsis, it, uh, it shouldn't be so hard because almost all our centers have renal units which also deal with uh, lines getting infected on a regular, well, maybe a bit too regular basis. But it, uh, it, it is something, is it any d different from your renal units having to deal with their like uh, uh, sort of, you know, lines? The line sepsis rate in an IF unit is much higher, well, in our IF unit, much higher than renal because you've got gut organisms all over the place. So if you look at 50% of our line sepsis is um, gut organisms. Whereas you know, vast the vast majority of line sepsis in any other line is a, is a staff, so we see um you know we get a lot more from that whether it's bacterial translocation or just intra abdominal seeding of the abscesses because you've got abscesses etc. But I mean it, it's it's much much higher. Saying that once you've got patients established, St. Mark's rate of line sepsis was one line sepsis per patient per ten years. Ooh. Um. Their definition was a little bit stricter than mine. My definition of line sepsis is a temperature of 39 and a line. But um, they are actually very strict definitions, which you might not always meet. But it's, um, you know, look, it's a much bigger problem. And we've got the renal teams to come in and help us initially. And that didn't help very much. But whatever you do, if you have, if you have dedicated nursing staff that do it, they learn and they find a way. And, you know, we've had various training exercises. But the thing about these units is the patients stay for a long time and the nurses become quite attached to them. And that drives excellence all on its own. Nothing like being invested. Any other questions? I think we're at seven o'clock, so it's time to wrap it up unless it's pressing. All right, I've got something I have to say at the end. I get you a little lecture you've got to give. So I've got to say thanks, Nasif. It really was an excellent presentation, I think, for um, someone who hasn't worked in an IF unit. You've got all the important things, emphasized everything in the right place. Thanks to ECHO and the University of New Mexico and the ECHO India team for the support. Apparently, there are recordings on the Gastro Foundation website. And most importantly, on the 5th of August, Nutrition and Refeeding um, Syndrome, Dr. Omar Hardy and... Dion Levine will be chairing it.
I might just come online just to argue with Dion. <laughs> thanks, everyone. And thanks, Catherine, for your input. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Nasif. Bye.